Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. And, you know, a lot of interesting things have been going on in our economy lately. And I'm excited today to have a friend and a great patriot, Kevin Hassett, well known in the economic world. And uh, he was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and senior advisor for President Trump during his administration, and currently serves as the chair of the America First Policy Institute's Board of Academic Advisors and is a distinguished fellow in economics at the Hoover Institute. So, Kevin, thank you for joining us and welcome. It's good to see you, my old friend. <laughs> it's like old times. Yeah. Um, you know, I should tell the people, you know, everybody talks about the incredible boon that we had economically. Uh, during the Trump administration before COVID hit. Uh, Kevin was a big part of uh, helping to uh, engineer that, and uh, that should not be lost on the audience. Now, one of the things that's on everybody's mind right now, Kevin, uh, on Monday of this week, the stock market sort of had a little mini crash. It wasn't so many. It was pretty mm-hmm. big. <laughs> Uh, what what do you think uh, caused that to happen? You know, you know the people who study this, uh, who are really serious, and, and by that I don't mean economists in universities. I mean guys who are hedge funders who trade and make money on things. Um, they're they're basically seeing uh, three things, uh, but the big one is that there's a really really bad jobs report last week. And um, when you really dig into the numbers, then um, it's true that there's never been a jobs report that bad since going back to 1960 outside of a recession. And, and so therefore, what it really means, and I think they digested it over the weekend, what it meant was that we're probably in a recession or very close to the start of a recession. And when you get into a recession, stuff can go really south really fast, as, as, as you know, Ben. And, and uh, so what happens is people lose their jobs and then they can't make their house payments and then they default on their mortgage and then the bank's got bad loans and then the bank starts to be in trouble and, and everything can kind of spin out of control pretty fast. And I think that the market kind of panicked about the jobs data. Uh, but there are a couple other things, too. Uh, one of them is that uh, because uh, President Biden withdrew, uh, right before he withdrew, the odds of President Trump winning were really, really high, way up into the 70 percent, if you look at betting markets. And now it's about 50-50. And so there's a be- been a big increase in the odds that the Democrats with super socialist policies you know, are in the White House and are doing things like raising the corporate tax rate so that firms don't make as much money and, and you know, things like that. that raising make, everybody's tax rate. Yeah, everybody's tax rate. That's right. And, and, and so the point is that if, if you go from a very low chance of really bad economic policy, you know, mindful of the fact, for example, that the Trump tax cuts expire and have to be renewed next year. So if they're not, if there's not a Republican in the White House and controlling Congress, then they're all going to go away. You're going to have an automatic tax hike. So mindful of all that stuff, there's a reason also to be very anxious if you're in the stock market. And the third thing is just that uh, Japanese uh, policy has been um, has changed a lot in the last couple of weeks, and it exposed a bunch of traders to a potential big loss. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask you why it was so magnified in Asia and Japan. and so Yeah, on. that's why. And, and what was going on is that, that you could borrow money in Japan at basically almost a zero interest rate and then buy a U.S. Treasury at a 5% interest rate. And then you're making 5% on as much as you can do that with. And if you're like a big Wall Street firm or something, then you can borrow money in Japan. Right. And then like you and I can't do it. Maybe you can with all your riches <laughs> being a doctor. But, but, but the point is people were borrowing money in Japan and buying U.S. stuff. And now it looks like the U.S. interest rates going to have to go down because the economic data are bad. And so that hurts that trade that way. But also the Japanese government is raising interest rates at the same time. And so the gap between the two is getting smaller and a whole bunch of people panicked and had to get out of that trade all at once. And that, that's the other thing that happened. Well, you know, I, I find it fascinating that the a lot of the economists like to say that there's a cycle. It's an up and down sine wave like cycle to the economy. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I just find that fascinating because I don't think there's a cycle at all. I think we have people in office who know what they're doing, and then we have people who have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> it, there is a little bit of a cycle, but you're right that it's not predictable, right? Mm-hmm. So it does go up and down, but it doesn't do it in a way that's obvious. Right. Like you sort of know that the Super Bowl and the NFL is going to be like late January or whatever, or the election is going to be every four years. Like that's a cycle. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, is is there a chance that we're still going to have a soft landing with all this commotion that's going on? I, you know, again, there's never been a labor market looking as bad as this uh, outside of a recession since 1960 or so. Like, I haven't really dug into the pre-60 data. The reason we say since 1960 is that the detail data you need to really make that assessment isn't available before 1960, really. And so it's harder harder to see it. But it could, you know, we could dodge a bullet. But you know what's going on, uh, too? And and uh, it's something that you sort of see a little bit of a, a confusion about this, I think, in financial markets and in the press. The, the, it's not that there's a lot of people getting laid off yet. That happens in recessions, but it very often happens like almost near the end of the recession because right. firms don't really like to have to search for new people if you know the economy comes back, right? And so they tend to hold on to their people because it costs so much to find them. Uh, and so, it's, so it's not that people are getting laid off. What's going on is that nobody's getting hired, exactly. right? And, 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 and so you, like the firms are saying, oh, I'm a little anxious about how bad this is going to be, so I'm just not going to hire anybody. And so the people who are looking for jobs right now they're not finding them, but right. but you don't see spikes and layoffs yet. But you do see like a collapse in hiring, and that's sort of what you usually see at the start of a recession. And also, a lot of people will probably lose one of their jobs, but there's a lot of people working two jobs, yeah. so they right. count are counted in a different way. Uh, well, what should the Fed be doing right now? Everybody's got an opinion about what the Fed should do. Well, you know, I, I my opinion on this has changed uh, since the as bad as the data were last week, and and uh, the the Fed's going to cut rates in September, um, and I think that that's now the appropriate thing to do um, because the data really surprised me on the downside in the last month, and and so what's going to happen is the Fed's going to start cutting rates, and they're going to keep cutting rates maybe uh, into next year, and. Um, you know, I think the market already expects that. So I don't expect the market's going to have this big celebration because the Fed cuts rates in September because everybody kind of knows it's going to do that. Um, and, and whatever they do in an election year, it's going to be looked at in a funny way by. Yeah. Bunch. And and it's another thing to to uh, Ben that the. the that I know you're a man of science, of course. You're not like you aren't the science like Tony Fauci. He was <laughs> no, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things, the patterns that like we're talking about cycles. One of the patterns that is kind of regular in the data, uh, and I once wrote an academic paper about this, uh, is that when you get to a presidential election year, then beginning sort of right about now in the summer before the November where they vote, then everybody kind of puts plans on hold. Because they're a little worried that maybe this guy's going to win, maybe that guy's going to win. You know, I don't know what the policies are going to be. And so it's like a bad time to build a factory because you don't know if maybe, you know, Kamala Harris is going to come in and jack your taxes way up. Right. Uh, it's a bad time to buy a car because, you know, who knows what they're going to do. Uh, and, and, and also the people could see the stock market going down and stuff. And so they tend to pull back. And, and so if you look at it, then it turns out that forgetting about all the other things that we've seen, the, the relative odds of recession are, are about twice as high uh, around a November of, of a presidential election year, because at this time of year, everybody put thing, puts things on hold. And right. then if like a, you know, an anti-business government comes in, then they keep, keep them on hold. <laughs> right. Right. And then if a pro-business uh, government comes in, then there's a big celebration in, in November, and December. And you don't get a recession. But I think that we're kind of, it looks like we're reliving that pattern right now to me. If you were on the brink of a recession, uh, the likelihood of it increases substantially around exactly. that. Exactly. And, and, you know, one of the things that's interesting, too, about like the way Democrats talk versus the way they govern is that the, this, this dynamic played out when Barack Obama was elected president. And then um, you might recall that because the economy was so weak, 
and there was the financial crisis going on too, which wasn't right. like purely caused by this, that that he uh, extended the Bush tax cuts, the hated Bush tax cuts over exactly. and over again, because he didn't want a tax hike to, you know, kick the economy when it's down. And so they won't actually admit that, you know, there's supply side economics out there in an election. But when they're the ones who own the economy, then they, <laughs> they're they afraid to raise taxes because exactly. they know what it'll do. <laughs> well, well, you wrote a book called The Drift. Uh, what, was, what was that book about? Oh, sure. Well, one of the things uh, that is going on in this world is it feels like Western nations are just drifting towards socialism. Uh, and um, in my book, I, I sort of document the drift and I talk about how it's happening and also how, how to stop it. But uh, I also, uh, in, in the book, it's kind of an unusual hybrid book, uh, but I talk a lot about what you and I were doing, Ben, when we were in the White House. Right. Because I think people, uh, at, at President Trump understood that we're fighting a kind of existential battle against socialists. And if you go back and look at everything we were doing, it was basically trying to stop the slide to socialism. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's like if I had to you know, write a history 40 years from now of like the main theme of the Trump administration, I think it was like sort of the title of my book. We were trying to stop the drift towards socialism. And we did so much that accomplished that. Mm -hmm. And it just got reversed right away by Joe Biden. You know, it, it's just astonishing to me that he ran as a moderate and then he governed to the left of Bernie Sanders. Well, the the whole political landscape is really quite strange right now, with uh, people on the Democrat side extremely to the left and uh, pushing very socialistic uh, ideologies, mm -hmm. and people being hoodwinked or gaslighted into thinking that these are good things, and they're actually things that are detrimental to what people have enjoyed so much about this country. And I just pray that people will open their eyes and, uh, and actually look at the facts and listen to both sides. And, and I hope that the Republicans will talk about the facts and not get drawn into talking about personalities and people because yeah. they could easily lose that one. But they're never going to lose the one on the facts and what's going on. You're right. And, and the facts are, I'll, I'll uh, give you an example of, of this, that the, the facts are that, uh, that real incomes are down about $1,000 a year under Joe Biden. And under President Trump, they're up about $1,000 a year on average for average Americans. And the reason why incomes went up was that we had this sort of business friendly, economy friendly, worker friendly policy. And what the Biden administration has done is they've been basically doing everything they can to attack the wages of ordinary folks. And so let's go through some examples. So we've had the biggest trade deficits ever, sort of every year under Biden. And so what that means is if you're an ordinary worker that you got to compete with a low wage Chinese person, you know, and, and in fact, they're buying the stuff from the low wage Chinese uh, people rather than from you. And so that reduces the demand for your labor. You lose your job. You know, your wage goes down. That's what wages have been down under Biden. They've allowed millions and millions. We don't even know how many of people to cross the border. And, you know, when they come across, they give them a work permit and a Social Security number. Right. And, and so if you look at uh, job creation under Joe Biden, there's been a little bit of positive job creation, but we actually know that all the job creation is people who were non-U.S. born. And non-U.S. born people are, for the most part, these undocumented um, immigrants. And, right. and, and so, but what happens is your ordinary guy you know, or gal working in the U.S., and then all of a sudden millions and millions of people come in and they're competing with you. They're stealing your, taking your job, but also bidding your wage down again. So, so this immigration policy is driving down your wage. And then they print money and spend it, and that drives up the price of everything. So while your wage is going down, the price of everything's going up. And so their policy has been a disaster for ordinary folks. And I think people recognize they're not, uh, they're not stupid people. They, they obviously realize this. So why are they doing it, do you think? You know, I think it could be that, that they don't understand economics. If you look at the way they talk, it feels like they don't understand economics. And, and so it could be they mean well and they just don't have a clue. Um, but the one thing I could say is that, uh, that, that 
part of the democratic political strategy is to make people dependent on government. Right. And if, once you're dependent on government, then they have power over you. And if your wage is growing a lot, then you're not dependent on them because you're just dependent on yourself and, and your own talents. But, it, but they, so I kind of feel like they, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's like a, a, a sort of subtle thing. That's not really a conscious thought for them, but, but they love it when they make people dependent on government. The mm -hmm. final thing is that they're, they're always buying people's votes with like the student loan forgiveness program and all that kind of stuff. And if you think about it, if you're going to buy a vote, then it's going to be a lot more expensive to buy a vote from a, person with a high wage than a person with a low wage. True. And so they, so for their political equilibrium, it kind of feels like, you know, I, and again, I not going to assert that they got a conspiracy to do this, but, but it's like crazy that wages never grew under president Obama over the eight yeah. years, wages were flat and that's they called true. it the new normal. Remember? It's like, yeah. it's not president Obama's fault. It's just, that's the new normal. And then we came in, we got wage growth and president Biden, uh, and and Harris have given us no wage growth. So so think about it. The Biden Harris Obama team is zero for twelve creating wage growth for workers. Mm -hmm. They're zero for twelve, and except for COVID, we we were basically three for four. But you could say three for three. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and so I just don't understand how how people who who like are working every day to get some wages and bring them home and feed their family could look at that evidence and not be moved by it. And, and, and it goes back to what you said, that, that they don't want you to look at the evidence because right. it's so bad for them. <laughs> and so they're going to be saying, oh, J.D. Vance is weird, or you know, Donald Trump said an outrageous thing. And they're going to distract people from the substance that really affects their lives. You know, that, that what really affects their lives is what's happening to your wage. You no, know, are you going to lose your job to this guy who just uh, came across the border? That's exactly what Marxists do. They make you dependent on them, dependent on the government. And, you know, our founders actually realized that, uh, you know, it, this, this is not new. Socialism and Marxism is not new. It, it's been a long, long time before the United States was there. But, uh, you know, they looked at every government system that ever existed. They were really quite academic in their studies because they wanted to keep us free. And they wanted to be a country that was very much run with respect to the will of the people. But they recognize in their study of all the governments that they all sort of end up moving in the same direction. No matter how lofty their goals are in the beginning, the governments grow, infiltrate, and dominate. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to figure out a way that that could not happen. But that's exactly what's happening to us. Government growing and taking over our lives. And it's really going to require the people to understand what's going on. That's such an important part of being able to keep America free. What would be a good policy for the next administration to bring some healing to our economic landscape? Sure. Well, well the, the crucial thing uh, is that the really effective policies that gave us 3% growth, you know, $6,000 in real income growth for the typical family uh, before COVID. And then it was even 4,500 after COVID, right? Like, 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 so, so again, and it's minus 2,000 under Biden. So it's a 6,500 different. Those policies that created them, a lot of them expire and the Democrats are going to let them expire unless they're renewed next year. And, and, Honest goodness, because I know this was a policy that you cared so much about, uh, Ben, but but the opportunity zone policy expires. Right. And, and, and it's kind of a metric of how twisted politics has become in this country for me, that opportunity zones is a super well intentioned uh, project to try to get people to go and send capital, invest and create businesses in the most distressed communities in the country and like places like Anacostia here in D.C., and hundreds of billions of dollars have gone into these distressed communities. Uh, and, and so the, the program is a really big success. But since it passed as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, the Democrats have decided that it's a Trump policy, or some of them have. Right. And I think there's a risk that they won't even renew opportunity zones just because they want to erase everything that President Trump did. But if you become so partisan, that you will give up a policy that's successfully helping the most distressed people in our country just because you hate a man, then you need to sort of 
check what you're thinking and, and check your attitudes and check how your brain is working and what TV shows you're watching. Because th we are in a world where, as an example, opportunity zones might expire. So thing one is I think we need to extend what we've done. And if you look at what President Trump is talking about when he's on the campaign trail, he thinks that we should double down on that and pay for it by eliminating all the super wasteful spending that's passed uh, over the last four years. And so so think about the the billions and tens of billions of dollars they, they spent uh, building new electric charging stations. And right. the last I checked, they've only built seven. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so we, we could just sort of stop spending that money and stuff and use it to, to extend opportunities. Also. Well, hopefully people will put their brain into gear and start thinking about some of the things that are being said. For instance, uh, the left likes to say that Trump increased the national debt substantially. Uh, and he did. I won't deny that. But why did he do it? Because our military was in such bad shape. Uh, half of our planes didn't fly. The, the, the fleet was uh, in terrible shape. And we were extraordinarily vulnerable. And that was a very urgent thing to get us back up to speed because weakness creates opportunity for our enemies, as, as we can see that's been going on over the last few years. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to understand all that in context in order to be able to interpret what charges are being leveled against different people. But speaking of the, uh, the national debt, you know, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that in the next decade, it'll hit $56 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, servicing the debt will be the biggest obligation of the government each year, uh, which means taxes will have to be absurd. Um, you know, how worried should we be about this surge in the national debt and what should we do? We should be really worried about it. And to go back to the President Trump and the debt point, you know, the, the, the numbers that they use when they're attacking him include the debt that was uh, rung up when we basically had to save the world from COVID. Uh, and, and that was an extraordinary circumstance. And, you know, as you know, I was in the middle of the White House senior advisor to the president trying to keep the economy from going off the rails when Tony Fauci shut the economy down. And you know, I think we did a pretty good job of that. And, and, and but outside of that, here, here's a fun fact for you, because I know you're a numbers guy, Ben, the, that before the Trump tax cuts, uh, which, again, he advocated them on supply side for supply side reasons, uh, then the U.S. government was raising about 17 percent of gross uh, domestic product uh, in tax revenue. Um, right now, it's 17 and a half percent. And so the, the actual revenue went up, uh, even though the tax rates went down. It's, you know, Art Laffer started mm -hmm. talking about this a gazillion years ago, and he's one of the first people that really got canceled. Right. That's a really scary thought for the, you know, the socialists. Uh, but but the Laffer curve is there. But what happened is that spending, which is, you know, averaged kind of around 19 percent of GDP forever and ever went up during COVID. And then the Democrats kept it high after they came in. And so spending this year is going to be about 24 percent of GDP. Yeah. And and we're running maybe about a six and a half percent deficit. And we've been doing that year after year after year. And it'll be easy to fix. It's the easiest thing in the world. Uh, it, it's kind of like when you were a doctor and somebody comes in and they've got something you look at and say, oh, I know how to fix that. Right. <laughs> right? But sometimes people come in and they got a rash and a headache and you don't know what the heck's going on and you got a lot of work to do. But this yeah. is not the second one. This is, you know, they got like a. Or, a, they, come a, in, or they come in and they say, Doc, it hurts when I do this. <laughs> so don't do that. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is an easy thing to fix. This is one of those cases where you would like let the, the resident do it because it's so obvious what to do. Uh, right. and, uh, and, and it's just you got to cut spending and then restore a business friendly environment. The job numbers were a little bit distressing, 114,000. And unemployment rate rose to 4.3%, which is the first time it's been a I think above 4% in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's the beginning of a trend or is it just a blip? 
No, this is what what if we began the show. It, it, it's a nice, precise question because it allows me to go into more detail uh, into it. But basically, over the last year, the unemployment rate has gone up by almost a percent, a full percentage point. And the history of it is that the unemployment rate doesn't usually really want to go up. It, it's a very sticky thing. And right. when it starts going up by as much as a percent, then usually it keeps going. And so if we have a typical pattern um, that we see over and over uh, in the history of the unemployment rate, then it's going to go from where it is right now, you know, way north of 5%, uh, five percent, five and a half percent, six percent before it starts going down again. Um, and we're going to have to go through a painful recession. And I think that that's kind of the result of all the really bad policies that we've had in the last four years. Uh, you know, prices went up a lot. Wages didn't. So people had lower real incomes and with a lower real income, then you get lower GDP, you know, and less employment. And that's something that I think that we're just about to go through in, in, a, in a pretty bad way. It, it could turn the other way though. There, there are a lot of positives in the economy, like the artificial intelligence boom is actually really affecting productivity. People who bring AI consultants in, you know, they run their businesses more effectively. They got lower costs and things. So, yeah. so there are some things that could overwhelm the bad policies. But, but here's the the metric of like, but people, you know, how they talk about Bidenomics and it's like the least popular thing. I guess now we have to call it Harrisonomics or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but, but get this, get this. This is the thing that's most striking to me about their policies. That for the last couple of years. There's amount. There's something like called like debt held by the public. It's like the, how much government debt there is. That right. and the public is not just our public. It's everybody's public. It's just like how much have we borrowed as a government? And if you look at the change in how much we borrowed over the last year, um, it's a lot bigger than the change in GDP. Okay. And so, so the way to think about it is this: Suppose I'm running a small business, and I borrow a hundred thousand from the bank, and I give my wife a job, and I pay her fifty thousand bucks. And then the other 50,000, I blow on a bender in Vegas, just gone. And then at Christmas, you know, my family all gets together, probably Thanksgiving more than Christmas. And somebody says, so how's your year been? And I said, oh, it's great. Our family income's up 50,000. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's Bidenomics. Yeah. Well, I, I noticed that they don't talk about Bidenomics very much anymore. Yeah. And I, su I suspect it'll be cast into the dustbin of history pretty soon. But, um, you just uh, mentioned taking fifty thousand dollars and giving your wife a job. Uh, do you think the the days of uh, one income in the family are gone? Uh, it depends on which family, but for you know ordinary folks, uh, everybody, you know, it's not. Let's just say that that probably a lot of families out there have three jobs between the two of them, if there are two of them together, right? Or four jobs. And, and, and so so the average number of jobs per family is probably the highest it's ever been because of inflation and how hard it is uh, to get stuff uh, done. And it, and it actually goes back to something that President Trump talked about where he said, I don't think that seniors should have to pay tax on Social Security. You know, because of inflation, and I know Social Security is adjusted for it, but it's not a very big check. Living on Social Security is really a hard thing to do. But but if you are having trouble making ends meet because of your Social Security and inflation, that if you get a job, then they take your benefit away. Not all of it, but there are, you know, there are estimates that the total tax rate that you can pay could be like the highest tax rate that anybody pays, higher than what Jeff Bezos pays. And, and, and so uh, it's a really difficult thing, but. I mean, to think about to get by on Social Security and the, it should be a stronger program. But President Trump's like, well, we got to let people get back to work. And, 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 you know, have a job and, and not just rely on Social Security if that's what they want to do. But you can't do that, um, given the structure of it, because the tax is so high. And the reason the tax is so high is that they start taxing it if your income is above $25,000. And the $25,000 number was set by a law change in 1984, and it wasn't indexed for inflation. And so it's been the same number since 1984. And President Trump has seen that. And he says, we really got to change that for seniors so that if they want to also just it's fun to have a job sometimes. If they want to get out there and get out of the house, then we shouldn't take away their Social Security. Logic and common sense. Well, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the impact that the illegal immigrants are having. Uh, but uh, some people on the left says it's a good thing to have these people coming in because the average birth per woman 
is down to 1.6. It takes 2.1 just to maintain the population. Uh, so they're saying we need to be importing people in order to maintain our population. What do you have to say about that? I think that, uh, and, and uh, I just, it's actually kind of a story that people forget, but, but I was part of the team that President Trump assembled to reform legal immigration. So I'm not an expert on border security and walls and things, but he asked me to study immigration, legal immigration policies of countries around the world and report to him on what the best policies were, the most effective and successful policies were. And we had a legal immigration reform that could have really significantly expanded legal immigration, mm. uh, and but done so in a targeted way so that we're bringing in people that will help create jobs for people already here and so on, not just take the jobs away. And, and so I think that there is uh, room for what you're saying. And I think a lot of the sort of stuff that's going on, um, discouraging like, you know, traditional relationships and so on is going to have a big effect on fertility. And uh, I just noticed that Elon Musk uh, tweeted uh, today. It's, you know, Thursday, August 8th, when you and I are talking. I don't know if we always say the date, but but he tweeted something today where he showed that the, the last year the population growth declined in almost every country on Earth. The people have sort of stopped having kids. It's a very troubling thing. Yeah, it is. And a combination of that and people not knowing what sex they are, uh, we could dis we could extinguish the human race. <laughs> we continue down this line. Um, I wanted to ask you about the effect of Biden's releasing all the oil from our reserves, uh, trying to drive down the prices. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? The uh, strategic uh, reserve is there for emergencies. That's why we got it. Uh, in case you have a war, uh, suppose there were a war to break out of the Middle East, you know, and, and under their failed foreign policy, it's reasonably likely. Then you want to have like a bunch of reserve oil in case all of a sudden the, the shipping start, stop coming for a while because there's a disruption of the Suez Canal. And, and, and so, again, it, it, it's astonishing to me that this thing is it's kind of like a super rainy day fund, sort of like a thunderstorm fund that's supposed to be there in case of emergency. And they've run it down just to try to manipulate the price of oil for political purposes, even while the risk of war in the Middle East are probably the highest. I mean, there's already kind right. of war, but, but with Iran threatening Israel and everything, the risks of that getting out of control are enormous. When you need it, this is this, right. This is a time when we need it more than we've ever needed it before, and you're draining it down. I mean, it's just an example of the kinds of asinine policies that are going on right now. And you know, these things I think need to be explained to the American people because most people really haven't sat down to think about this. They're just trying to make sure they have enough money to put food on the table and gas in their tank and to get where they need to go. And uh, in the meantime, there are those who are taking advantage of the fact that people aren't thinking about these. But um, the uncertainty in the Middle East is combined with draining our oil reserves could create some real issues in the future. And it's one of the reasons that Trump says, first thing I get in, drill, baby, drill and start taking advantage of uh, all the natural resources we have. Um, but I would, I would love it if he would, I, I know he understands it very well, but a lot of people don't understand very well when he says how that's going to solve the problem of inflation. Mm -hmm. Well, it can. And, and, and actually, there, there's a thing here that's like a sort of technical thing, but it's kind of fun too. So I'm going to bother. Uh, <laughs> the, the, all the the latest oil that we've been getting, um, that we sort of got, especially like under Trump, uh, the it, it tends to be you know oil oil and gas that's been fracked, uh, and and the way that process works is they sort of squirt water down into the ground, right, and then it creates a lot of pressure, and then the oil pops up and the gas pops up. Um, and, and the thing that's interesting about that is that the old way of doing it, right, is that there's some underground lake somewhere and you stick a straw down and you start right. sucking it out and then it goes a little lower, a little lower, a little lower, and then you don't have any. But because they put so much pressure on these wells, then a whole bunch of the stuff comes out right at once. 
like as soon as you open it up. And and so get this, the, so for a typical fracked well, 60% of the oil they're ever gonna get out of it comes out the first year. Mm. Okay, and so what that means is that what's been going on in the Biden administration is that he's been sort of riding a honeymoon from all the exploration under President Trump, but we're about to hit the wall because they had sort of been so anti-fossil fuels. And, and, and so first of all, when we expand, the, there is an inflationary effect on inflation, but the problem is the absence of new exploration in the US and, and new production in the US is a real threat to global markets because these wells deplete so much faster than than the old wells. Was that too technical? I hope not. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes perfectly good sense. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that we need to be talking about so that people understand. But uh, on an even more simplistic basis, uh, if we have plenty of oil and we have a lot of money coming in from liquid natural gas uh, export. Uh, then the cost of gasoline goes down and the cost of transportation goes down and everything has to be transported on trucks. Right. So, um, and that cost gets passed on to the consumer. So all of a sudden your grocery bills maybe start going down because even though we've seen the inflation numbers drop, we haven't seen a concomitant drop in grocery prices. Why do you think that is? You know, uh, it, it, what's going on is that the inflation rate is dropping. And so instead of everything going up at like 6%, it's going up at 3%. And the problem is that it already went up sort of 20 something percent right. before it slowed. But even then it's growing from a higher base, right? So, so <laughs> <laughs> so you got three percent of like a dollar twenty instead of three percent of a dollar is is what people are seeing, and so the a three percent on a higher base is actually could make you worse off than a five percent on a lower base, and so people are not feeling a lot better about inflation in part because there's been so much inflation that increasing prices even further, which is still happening just at a slower rate, it, it's more painful because they already stopped you out. And I was thinking about this that that it's one of those things that uh, in, in my family, we allocate tasks according to what people like to do. And one of the things I like to do as an economist is do all the shopping, the grocery shopping, uh, because I like to walk around the grocery store and see what stuff costs. And uh, I, we were doing some recipe and I had to get some bacon. Uh, and, I, and I go to the store and the bacon is like, oh my gosh, it's $9 a pound. I couldn't believe it. Like I, I can remember when bacon was like three bucks a pound, right? It's nine bucks a pound. And then I get it home and I'm starting to look at the recipe and stuff like that. And I look at the package and it says 12 ounces. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, 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 and I should have looked at the ounces before I, I bought it. I would, but, but this is what Americans are going through, yeah. right? That, that they're seeing huge. And, and so if it goes from nine bucks to, you know, $9 and 30 cents, then they you know, they're telling you, oh, inflation's gone down. So you should be happy. Right. Like, oh, I wanted to go back to what it was before. <laughs> and, well, and that's the other thing is that, that things like meats and, and, and stuff that, that maybe, you know, people are less likely to stop buying when prices go up because they need to feed their family, that those things have gone up by a lot more than the average inflation rate. And that's the other thing is that people know that. Final thing about inflation, that's another really interesting thing is that all of our measures of inflation don't include interest rates. True. Okay? And, and, and so what it means is suppose you bought a car for 30,000 bucks two years ago, then the interest rate was a lot lower. And, and so the monthly payment wouldn't be nearly as big as it is now. But if you bought the car for 30,000 bucks this year and you bought it for 30,000 bucks last year, probably you're looking at, you know, an extra, you know, 20% on your monthly payment, but it doesn't affect the inflation rate. Right. It doesn't be because they're just saying, oh, it was 30,000 both times. So there's no inflation. Mm -hmm. But the interest is is a big part of the cost for everybody. Most Americans have credit card debt and car loans and mortgages. And a lot of people with adjustable rate mortgages are feeling a lot of pain. Absolutely. And none of that is in our measure of inflation. There seems to be quite a housing deficit going on right now. Mm -hmm. People can't find how. What do you think is going on? Sure. Uh, it's related to all the illegal immigration, which is at least five million, but probably a lot more than that. 
Um, and the point is that it kind of takes a long time to build a house, even if you don't have a local government getting in your way. Mm -hmm. And so the supply of housing moves really, really slowly. But the demand for housing depends on how many you know, people we got in the country. And by having this massive expansion in population from immigrants, we've put a, a big increase in demand in housing. And then you can say, well, these immigrants are coming in, they're kind of low income folks. And, and, and so they maybe they're just driving up the price of the houses that are the cheapest. Uh, but actually what happens is that the person who, you know, sells the house to say to someone that's going to rent to illegals, they got to buy another house and they buy it from somebody. They buy another house, they buy another house. And so you find actually that housing prices from the bottom of the top tend to move together because people are playing kind of musical chairs uh, with the houses. And, and um, the average rent for the typical family that rents uh, in the country is up about 500 bucks a month since Biden yeah. took office. And 500 bucks is a lot. So mm -hmm. that means that if you didn't get a, a $6,000 raise after tax, then yeah. you're worse off just because of your rent. And then you also have the problem of uh, you can't find another house to move into because nobody's moving out of their house because they don't want to give up that low interest mortgage. Right. <laughs> so it's sort of a domino effect in lots of different ways. But, uh, you know, a lot of our young people, uh, young college graduates, young families, you know, to them it seems virtually impossible to be able to afford a house. And uh, do you have a message of hope for those Americans, especially those young ones who think the American dream is out of reach? Yes, if we cut this runaway spending, then we can reduce inflation and make it create space for mortgage rates to come down. And we can increase the supply uh, by doing things as President Trump has proposed, like allowing federal lands around cities, which are everywhere, uh, that, that auctioning some of those off so that people can build new houses. And so if we increase supply and you know cut the runaway inflation, then interest rates will go down and people will be able to buy a house again. The, the fact of the matter is macroeconomics and microeconomics are the same. What works for you in your private life and in your home also works at the macro level. And we need logical people who understand logic and common sense uh, at the helm of our government. And, uh, you know, those can be Democrats or they can be Republicans. What we need to be looking at is what are their policies. And uh, I would just uh, say to people who are listening, make sure you understand the basic economics for you and your family so that you can compare that with the policies that are being espoused by the various politicians. And if they won't talk to you about their policies, if they have nothing to say and if they hide from you, run for the hills. <laughs> I can tell you. Well, Kevin, I just want to thank you for being willing to share your economic expertise. And I, I hope that uh, you're going to have a much bigger role to play as we try to heal this economy. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. It's great to see you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that fascinating discussion with uh, Kevin Hassett. He's a real gift to us as a nation, as an economist. But it's so important that we don't just sit around and complain. Spend a little time learning about economics and thinking about how it affects your life and the life of all of your loved ones and those that you support. Because the more you know, the more difficult it is for people to pull the wool over your eyes. That's what gaslighting is all about. We're going to see intensive gaslighting over these next few months before the election. People telling you, don't believe what your eyes are telling you. Don't believe what your ears are telling you. Just listen to us. Just listen to us and you'll be just fine. And they're telling you things that you know are false, but they keep saying it. And then you turn the channel and they're saying it there too. And then you read the paper and they're saying it there too. And they're all using the same language. You're going to be easily fooled if you're not 
knowledgeable. And that's why before communists, socialists, Marxist governments take over, they always dumb down the population. Don't be a part of that. And that's it for this week. And make sure you get your podcast from Apple, wherever you get them from. Rate us, review us. We like those five plus ratings. You can go back and you can see some of the older ones. We have multiple podcasts now. And uh, spread common sense. We want to make common sense common once again. See you next week.